Welcome to this edition of Peak Performers Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performers Podcast. I'm your host, Thor Conklin, and you are going to absolutely love our guest today. I've already prepped them. I said, you know, normally we record for about 30 minutes. I said, uh, schedule out at least three hours. It won't be that long, but uh, man, we got so much to, uh, to dive into. Uh, awesome. Tim Hauser, serial entrepreneur, speaker, inspiring author, who's best known as co-founder and CEO of Grasshopper, a virtual telephone service acquired by Citrix for $176 million. You can't live on that, but that's a good start. Uh, today's he's shifted his optimization focus to health and fitness, sharing his own journey of transformation in the book, Unstoppable. Four steps to transform your life in this book. David documents the micro adjustments he has made in his own lifestyle busting myths around fad dieting and trendy workouts. Today, we'll hear some of the most important lessons he, he's learned along the way. Man, you are talking about my two favorite subjects, scaling companies and health and fitness. We include all of that in all the coaching uh, work that we do because, man, if you make a bundle and you don't have the health to enjoy it, you did not win. Yep. Yeah, and I also um, spent far too many years uh, caring about other people's health. Like I knew how important employee health was, and I ignored my own. Um, and I've talked to so many entrepreneurs that do the same thing, right? Rather than focusing on making themselves great so their companies can be great. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I want to kind of split this interview up into two sections. And if I stick to this, I'll be amazed at myself. But the first one, I want to talk about uh, Grasshopper and how you got it to where uh, you got it to the point where you could sell it uh, for that number. And then second, I want to dive into the, the health and fitness and talk about uh, your new book. So you start Grasshopper. First of all, I'm one of your customers. So every month, you know, you, you guys get, <laughs> get uh, you know, some money out of us. A great concept, great company. Um, but how did you take that thing from inception and idea? Just bring us along the way how that journey evolved, because at some point, I'm sure the thing just started to skyrocket. Yeah, I mean, it was a great journey. So we started the business 14 years ago, and it took us 12 years to sell it. Um, and what was interesting is when we started the business, we had no intention of ever selling it, right? Like me and my business partner said, what do we want to do? We want to create a, create a great company where we love being, right? And that's, that was our goal. We had no exit plan, right? And people always thought we were crazy. And, you know, along the way, because we were self-funded, we had all these conversations with VCs and other people like, how do you not have an exit plan? We're like, well, because we don't have funding, we don't need an exit plan, right? right? Um, so it was just a different approach for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, we started with nothing. Like we had a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars from past ventures, and we needed like three hundred thousand dollars just for the equipment to buy to get started. So we negotiated like attractive terms, and we we got one of our vendors to buy in and give us like sixty or ninety day terms, like those types of things. Like that's how we got going. Um, but yeah, we did scale pretty well. And I love this, you know, everyone looks at a company like Grasshopper and says, you know, look, it came out of nowhere and all of a sudden they, they sell it for this big uh, number. It's 14 years, 14 years in the, in the making. And as you're starting out, you know, what were the first couple of years like? Yeah, I mean, the first couple of years, like our, our goal was to do every job ourselves before we hired someone, right? Like because we were self-funded, we were both limited in cash, but also we were limited in right? like we could learn and make mistakes ourselves, but hiring someone was a big commitment, both from a capital perspective, as well as a commitment to a person, right? Like you hire someone full time, you're making a commitment to them. And I think that that made us to make very clear decisions where like literally like I was answering customer service phone calls and emails for the first six months before we hired our first employee who did that. Right. And we just kind of kept going along that process again and again and again. And, and if you had something to kind of credit for the success and, and the, the acceleration of the success, was it affiliate programs? Was it, uh, you know, Facebook advertising, Google AdWords? I mean, what, what, was it that really gave you the traction? 
Yeah, I think there were two things. So first of all, like this was before Facebook, this was before Google ads even. So we, we were able to run Omniture ads, which were like the first inception of these, you know, search-based intent ads. They were very cheap. So we were able to buy traffic at a very low dollar cost. Um, so combine that with our high numbers of referrals. So 30% of our customers were coming from referrals, even in the early days. So if you put those two, two things together, we knew that we could attractively spend as much money as possible because of the referrals and driving the total cost down. And that continued over time. So if I look back and say like, what created the grasshopper success? 100% paid marketing, right? Like that's not to say we didn't do other things. We had a great SEO presence and organic SEO. We did all sorts of other things, influencer branding, and we also did social as it got newer, but it all came down to paid ads. We knew we could put a dollar in, get a dollar fifty out, repeat the process again and again and again. Yeah. What? What? You know, obviously everything changes so quickly. Today, late two thousand nineteen, if you were going to start it all over again, what would you do differently with regards to the marketing and and getting that scalability? So I mean, I, I would I would change the channels that we're talking about, but I would use the same techniques, which is finding channels that are attractive in terms of price where these are newer channels. So maybe this is Pinterest, maybe this is podcasts, maybe like where can I find channels where I can buy eyeballs and traffic at a cheaper rate than the very competitive AdWords or Facebook today, right? Like those are highly competitive places with people that are highly optimized. I, I wouldn't necessarily start there. I'm looking for the new channels, the things that are different right? And start getting my first customers in. Now on the referral side, do you have a very uh, structured program for the referrals or is this just something that organically kind of grew? This was hundred percent organic. I wish we were smart enough to say like we came up with this, right? Um, it just started happening. When we started seeing it over the years, we tried all sorts of programs, right? Like structuring this right and you know giving reward to the referee and the referred like discounts we did all sorts of games right and quite honestly none of them worked as well as just asking customers for a referral not giving them anything no discounts no bs no programs no tracking just after a good experience by the way would you could you refer anyone like that made it a trusted referral to another business owner compared to, hey, uh, Joe, get $15 off. Then you're like, eh, why is he sending me this, right? Yeah, yeah. So you actually had a, uh, you had a formal program of after they're in for a certain period of time, you'd say, hey, if you have a good experience, we would love for you yeah. to refer us. Okay. Yeah, and also um, we had 24 by seven customer support where you could call in and speak to a human being in the United States, which is very rare for an online business, right? Um, so after a good experience there, we would also ask, right? Because we want to have those touch points again and again. Like even if you called in really pissed off, if we solved your problem, we, you became a lifetime customer at that yeah. point, yeah. right? And that's when we ask for the referral and say, look, we did right by you. Maybe there's someone else that we can help. Yeah. You know, it, it's those disgruntled customers. If you can turn them, they absolutely turn into gold. I, I was in the insurance business in New York uh, years and years ago. And first time I met the, my brand new client, private equity firm had bought them. I was brought in as their new guy. This guy was pissed off. I mean, he, he, would, I mean, he, would, he yelled, he cursed for about an hour. I, mean, I can remember the moment in the night. It was raining and it was, we were into this gondola thing in Pennsylvania or in Pittsburgh. And he was pissed off. Why he was pissed off was he was loyal. And once we became the new people and there was no going back, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't reverse the, the PE's uh, uh, point of view of who was going to service the account. He became just as loyal to us. And he became a, he was a client of mine years and years after I left the, uh, the business and he paid me a considerable amount every single year just to be there as an advisor. If you can turn the ones that are pissed off, man, they are gold. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think part of it is just listening, right? Understanding what they're upset about yeah. and fixing it for them, right? Like most of the time, what they're upset about is not that difficult a thing for you to fix, but the common experience is with most companies you speak to, you get ignored, you're told it's not possible, you know, like all those things. When you just listen and say, I hear you, I'm going to do everything I can to solve this. Like yeah. that's what someone wants, right? Yeah, it's crazy. You know, everybody wants to create this company where they can set an autopilot, do nothing, and the cash just rolls in. 
do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. Pick up yeah. the phone. Have a conversation with your clients. Yeah. It's, it's extremely, uh, extremely powerful. So I think what's interesting there is like we actually, because it was very expensive for us to run this call center 24-7, right? Um, like, so we actually moved that line item to marketing. So in, in our P&L, we looked at that as a marketing line item. Yeah. Um, which changed everyone's perspective in the company. Like, how do we deal with those employees? How do we deal with this expense? What things do we train on? What, like, what happens when it's a marketing expense, not a cost of goods sold? Yeah, it, it's, I just had some uh, issues, medical issues with my legs, varicose veins. From, from a medical standpoint, my legs kept swelling up. So I called uh, a doctor that did, did some other things. And it says, I said, I heard, remember I mentioned the doctor said she does varicose surgery. Oh yeah. You know, she's one of the premier, um, phlebologist or whatever they're called. Um, she's done the most in Georgia at, you know, she started, she was the original one to use the laser, blah, blah. She keeps going on and on. I was like, on your website, there's not one mention about you guys doing this. And, uh, the receptionist or whoever it was, like, oh no, it's just, you know, this woman does surgeries every single Wednesday. She, she does at least 10 cases a week. And I'm like, hello. So, so I decided to go with her based on the receptionist. She sold me on it because there was a human involved. Right. I yelled at the doctor too. I said, your marketing's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I know we got to fix that. But, but that's what sells people, that human yep. conversation. Yeah. And I think that's what actually the medical field is really interesting. We can discuss it later, but I think a lot of doctors don't understand the, the absolute importance of their front office. They could be the best doctor in the world. Right. And if their front office is not good, yep. they're, they then get looked at as a horrible doctor. Yep. Right. Because that's the interaction we have with doctors today is their front office. Yeah, Ab absolutely. All right. So one last question on the uh, business and we're going to switch over to the, uh, the health and the fitness side. If you had some advice to some entrepreneurs now that are scaling up their business, what are some bullet points, top items you're like, hey, this is something, oh, two-part question. The other one I don't want to forget about is the metrics that you're measuring. So I'll come back to that one next. But what, what advice would you give the, uh, the entrepreneurs out there? Yeah, the first thing I, I always advise is just go do something, right? Because like we always talk about stuff, but you actually have to go do something because every step of the way is either a learning or a success. And we take lots of small steps. So we never would have discovered, for example, um, advertising on satellite radio unless we just did it and said, you know, we're going to test it as small as we can to learn something and figure it out. It became a great channel for us. And we, because of it, ended up spending $12.5 million on radio advertising because we saw the success over the years, right? But if you had said, let's do radio advertising, it's too big a thing. We can't do it. Can't afford it. There's no data. So it's just a no, right? Um, so I think the first is just do something. Uh, and then two, I, I would say the, the general belief that everyone looks at like today, which is do social, do content, do these things only and ignore paid marketing, I think is the biggest mistake entrepreneurs that are starting out today make um, or even scaling, right? Because the general paradigm, and especially if we hear a company about San Francisco is like they were viral and it all just kind of happened. Like that just doesn't happen, right? Like there's one in a million cases and we read the stories about that. And we try to replicate that. And A, it is not replicatable. Uh, but what is replicatable is paid marketing. I can test a bunch of channels. I can find one that works and I can keep going again and again and again. So on to the question about metrics. Obviously, yeah. if you're doing any paid advertising, you've got to know your metrics. You've got to know what the ROI is. What are the key things that you guys were, uh, were tracking? Yeah, so over the years, we shifted a lot from lag indicators like revenue to leading indicators. Um, that was really important for us. So moving to number of new customers net new in the last 15 days, moving to things like, you know, 30-day cancellation rate compared to churn rate, right? Like churn rate is just constant because you have all these customers all the time. But 30-day churn tells me, am I adding good customers, right? Um, and, and things like that. Uh, we looked at a lot CPA, cost of acquisition, um, and now that's been shifted a lot to ROAS or return on ad spend. But, you know, we, we wanted to drive down our cost of acquisition and then our, pay down, our payback period as quickly as possible because the faster I got paid back, the more ads I could run, yep. right? Um, so looking at those metrics changed our business pretty significantly. 
And on the topic of metrics, I think what was really important for the effect of them is we pushed it throughout the organization. So everyone understood the metrics, everyone understood how they could impact them, right? So take, for example, 30-day churn, someone in customer service that has a direct impact, right? But how do I translate that to someone in operations, right? Who's managing servers and making sure things like that. So we gave them a metric that linked up to that, like uptime, right? Um, you know, speed at which the site loads, like things that relate to experience. So they knew that they had an impact in their day-to-day -day work. Nice. Love it. All right. We could continue on for hours on the business side, but it is a big passion of mine. We, uh, as I said, you know, every single, uh, business client that we have. This is one of the pillars uh, as the health and fitness uh, pillar. So why, why the switch other than, hey, I just sold my company. I, I've got a few dollars in the bank. Now I want to go do the shit that I want to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the, the switch came from one frustration. So more than 15 years of being overweight and trying everything that I possibly could and listening to what I've been told, exercise more, eat less, eat a low fat diet, like, and getting no success with it. So one, frustration, um, two, uh, more time, right? So I actually had the time to focus on it. And looking back, I wish I had done it far earlier, right? Like I really genuinely believe I lost out on productivity, happiness, and even success in the business because I didn't spend the time and focus on this. Um, even though what's interesting is I was spending a tremendous amount of time on exercise. I was training for mar marathons and triathlons and Ironmans. So we're talking about like seven hour bike rides, right? I did two last year, two Ironman <laughs> last year. I, I, I get it. It just, it, it wasn't good for my body and for my productivity, yeah. right? Like I, I was hurting my knees. There was all sorts of things happening. I was beating myself up all in this frustration of trying to lose weight. And what did you find? I know you have a couple of, uh, yeah, where were the show notes? So, <laughs> there we go. Master guidelines. Yeah. So so I found a few important things. One, I took a framework from the business, a very simple A-B testing or continuous improvement framework and applied that to myself and testing things for myself. That was a, a big change in, in what I could do and how I could see results. And again, that helped me see like small things. I could make a small change and see it happen, add it to my routine and then continue the process again and again, right? Give us an example of that. Yeah. So obviously people are always interested in testing diet. So like, that's the easy example. Let's give a more interesting example. So sleep, right? Uh, everyone's always been told sleep is critical. It's for rest and recovery, right? Um, I had always been a night owl. I had always stayed up late working. Um, and it seemed very daunting to say like, I'm going to wake up early in the morning, right? But it, it, if you put this in a process, you say, you know what? I'm going to change my bedtime by 30 minutes earlier. That's a very small change that anyone can do. You do that four times and you've changed by hours, right? Um, and then you're naturally waking up early instead of an alarm clock. Like, so now I go to bed between nine and 9.30, right? And, you know, so I think changes like that, but adding it to the routine allows you to make small changes again and again and again. Got it. Um, and then the other piece that really opened up the, the door for me was starting to question conventional wisdom and some of these myths that I talk about in the book. and like, I wish I could say like I was smart and I just came up with this. It was just purely frustration, right? Like at some point you're like, oh my God, I've been told to do this. I've done it to an extreme, right? Like exercise more. I'm like all in, I'm going to run a marathon, right? And it doesn't work. So I just said, you know what? I can't listen to conventional wisdom anymore. And I started to question those things and have a mindset that said, maybe it's wrong or more importantly, maybe it's wrong for me. Yeah. Yeah, everybody, everybody's different. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you found out that convention says this, but you said, for me, this was actually better? Yeah, so let's start with diet, right? So we're all told, eat a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. We can discuss if that's good or bad and why that's happened. Um, and I said, you know, that's not working for me. I've done it to an extreme. I cut out red meat. I did everything I was supposed to. So I said, I want to find the exact opposite extremes, right? Like, what are the most extreme diets I can test? Because I've done the shakes and the, the little stuff, which is a, it just like willpower, right? So I, I ate vegan for six months, right? I, I lost some weight. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Vegan's the thing to do, right? I'm losing a little bit of weight, but I feel hungry all the time. 
I have brain fog. I'm not being productive in the afternoons. I'm tired. So I'm like, maybe this doesn't work for me. Like, what's another extreme? Like, how far can I go, right? Clearly, the next step at that point, right, is a high-fat diet. So a ketogenic-type diet, whatever you want to call it, um, but consuming far more fat than we were ever told to do in the last 50 years, right? Um, that's worked tremendously well for me. Um, over time, I've migrated what that is, but like that worked well for me. In the afternoons, I'm far more productive. I don't have brain fog. I don't get tired like that. Um, most importantly, I don't feel hungry. And like if, if in the book I talk about this, it was a very difficult experience. The experience of feeling fat is one, but the experience of always feeling hungry is something that's always been there. Yeah. And to change that was magical. Interesting. So what does that, what does that look like? Is it more paleo? Yeah. I mean, it's probably, yeah, I mean, it's, it's closer to a ketogenic diet. So, um, I, I still don't, I don't eat any refined carbohydrates, no sugars, yeah. uh, things like that. I definitely eat more carbohydrates than what people think is a ketogenic diet, but it's all in the form of vegetables. Yeah. I actually like vegetables. I think they're good for you. There's nice fiber. There's all sorts of stuff in there. Um, so my plate is predominantly vegetables, uh, some protein, and then fat. And that fat could be with the protein or separately in terms of avocado, oil, butter, things like that. That's what my typical plate looks like. Snacking is, you know, cheese, nuts. Um, you know, I love avocados, uh, you know, that type of a thing. But I know carbohydrates that are, you know, refined ever. Yeah. Um, I, I just like, sometimes I'm like, ah, you know, maybe I... I used to love cakes and things like that. And every now and then I'm like, ah, maybe I really want one. And I eat it like a little bite and I'm like, ah, it's just not, I don't really like it that much anymore because it's too sweet. And then I feel like crap. Yeah. And I'm like, this is my body telling me something. I just, because I always felt like crap, it was, I couldn't notice it, right? Now I see it plain yeah. a day. Yeah. When, when you get away from it and come back. So I'm getting ready. Last year I did two Ironmans. This year I'm going to do a bodybuilding competition in eight weeks. Uh, which my trainer says I'm on track with, but you know, I've got another 16 pounds to shred. So I'm on, I'm on fish and asparagus. I'm like, well, what do I eat the other meals? He's like, <laughs> asparagus. Like, fish and asparagus for eight weeks. He goes, Oh, you can throw some water in there. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Uh, actually I could have some, some steak at, uh, at night. Um, but so it's funny, like, I, yeah, I actually recently watched West Side um, Barbell, um, which is yeah, a, about that. Yeah. Yeah. On Netflix. It's actually like, it wasn't the greatest produced um, documentary, but it was really interesting because it's a, something we never hear about. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that's a whole different type of bodybuilding, but it was pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I get the board shorts, you know, <laughs> the little Speedo thing. So every year I choose a difficult physical challenge. So last year I did the two Ironmans uh, back to back and uh, 30 days between. And uh, this year, um, bodybuilding. I don't know what's going to be uh, next year, but the focus is, look, if you're not feeling your best, you're not going to be able to perform in the boardroom. If you're not feeling the best, you're not going to be able to be there for your family the way you want to. I mean, everything comes back to our health. You can make as much money as you want, but if you don't have your health, man, you'll trade anything to get your health back. Yeah. So uh, about four months ago, I went down to Naples, and I'm sure you've researched this quite a bit too. If you're listening here in the audience today, the medical advances, the medical techniques and, uh, and um, things that are going to be available and the advances that we've made are going to blow your mind. We are doing incredible things that are going to be to market within weeks, months. It, it's, the next couple of years are going to blow your mind with regards to advances in medical technology. So it, I went down to Naples. Uh, did an MRI, a CAT scan, blood work, all that stuff. Sliced my body into 9,000 slides. I mean, they could tell every single, they could tell the veins uh, throughout the entire body what was going on. And then took my DNA and split the DNA in two and, and analyzed each of the uh, components. Then ran it through a software system that basically said if there was some sort of precancer that was going to show up in 4.2 years, here are some of the markers that indicate that that might uh, occur. So just crazy stuff. And I know that you do some annual testing and things that people should look at every single year. What are some of those things that we need to be looking at? 
Yeah. So I think for most people, what I, I recommend is looking at inflammation markers, right? So we, we always get like typical blood tests and I actually do my blood testing every three months and it's a lot of blood. So I did this about a week ago. I think it was about 40 vials um, of blood. So it's 40. a small, yeah, it's a small blood donation. Um, and I test all sorts of things, right? Um, and I, I don't recommend most people do that. It's not necessary. I'm tracking all sorts of stuff. I'm testing things. There's things happening, right? But the most critical are inflammation markers like HSCRP, fibrinogen, um, ferritin, you know, things that show where, what type of inflammation we might have in our body. Because I think is if we start to look at where the medical field is going to end up in the coming years, most of it is going to be focused on inflammation, right? And if you look at the underlying data about some of these things, um, for example, statins, um, I, I have high cholesterol. I would never take a statin. Like, and we can discuss why that is, but there's lots of data about that. However, what's most interesting to me is the reason that statins might have an effect on lowering mortality, and the data is actually not very clear on this, is because it reduces inflammation and it might deactivate mTOR, which is a certain receptor that we have, right? Um, not that it lowers cholesterol. It might be doing other things for us. So I think if we look forward into what's happening, inflammation is one that's going to be the most. And then two, uh, metabolic markers, right? So that's things like fasting insulin. That's things like, you know, our glucose over time. Uh, there's other ways of testing this. But those are, for the majority of the population, the most critical. Because most people today even though they don't technically have diabetes, definitely have the beginnings of metabolic disease, uh, which is related to obesity, heart disease, everything else. And all that means is they have high sugar and high insulin, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I think that's what we're going to see in the coming years. It, it, it's crazy. Uh, a good buddy of mine uh, just did a thing on Instagram or something. He goes, you want to know what to eat? Just go to the grocery store and look at the label. All right, and then look at the label and analyze it really carefully. So he picks up a banana. He goes, no label. I guess I can have that. If it has a label, put it back. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I never really heard it, uh, you know, uh, chunked down that easily. If it has a label, put it back. Yeah, stay on the outside aisle of the supermarket, yeah. right? Like, not in the middle. Um, and I think one of the things that's most disturbing to me, um, because I'm now involved in the food business, is a lot of these vegan products, right? Like Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat and stuff like this, like, they're supposed to be healthy, right? Because they're vegan, right? I can make a lot of things vegan that are tremendously unhealthy for you. Yeah. Um, but I just can't understand how this tremendously processed item that's a collaboration of like soybeans and oils and random things made to look like meat could possibly be something that's good. Yeah. Right. Like maybe it has no damage. Like it's neutral to meat. Maybe. Yeah. I highly doubt that, yeah. but it is definitely not better. <laughs> yeah. It's, and I'm so shocked at the number of people uh, that come to work with us and we talk about, all right, let's, let's look at the diet. Oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm eating this. I'm like, when did you think that that was, it was a, it was a yogurt uh, uh, parfait. I'm like, do you have any, any idea how much sugar's in yogurt? <laughs> yeah, but so, I mean, people don't understand, right? Like eating a, three slices of toast for breakfast is the same as just piling sugar into a bowl and eating it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it has the same effect on our bodies. Now, obviously yogurt just has hidden sugars because to make it taste good, they just add a bunch of sugar, right? Um, I used to eat plain yogurt. And if you gave that to someone who loves yogurt, they won't touch it. No, no. Right? But that's what yogurt should taste like. It's crazy. All right, so seven principles of living an unstoppable lifestyle. Oh, boy. So it depends what area we're talking about. Um, there, there's a lot. So we've talked about diet, obviously. Um, but there's also sleep, exercise, um, mindfulness and meditation, um, supplementation and vitamins. Uh, and then things like exposure to heat, cold, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and then most importantly, breathing. Um, yeah. So I think those are the main categories. And the idea with the book is to really, one, deliver information and say, here's a framework for testing. Uh, two, here's some myths that you know, may or may not be true. Let's think about them, but more, most importantly, open our minds. And then here, lastly, are the categories to start thinking about where do I test? 
And I want to use the same filter for all of it, which is how do I get the most benefit for the least effort? Doesn't mean easy, but I still want to, you know, have the least effort in. So we could talk about some crazy stuff that is very expensive and very difficult to do, but that's the lowest on my list, right? Maybe just going to bed at 930 is the highest. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to throw out a curveball here because we're running out of time. So many people, most people are interested in scaling the business. Most people are interested in having a healthy lifestyle and feeling energized, et cetera. As you and I know, interest it doesn't matter to the universe. <laughs> Very few are committed. And I hear a lot of, I lack the discipline. You know, we, we know that motivation doesn't work because that's just kind of like a, a shot in the arm of, uh, uh, of adrenaline, right? Quick burst, but that doesn't last. Discipline, discipline. You are a very, I'm going to say, you appear to be a disciplined individual. You don't build a company like you guys built without being disciplined. You don't create a body and energy like you've done. So what are the keys to discipline and, and long-term success and changing habits? Yeah. Yeah. So one is routine. So for sure, like everything in my life is created in a routine. Uh, so I go to the gym at the same time. I get ready the same way. I wear roughly the same clothes. Like I probably have three colors of this that are varying colors of black and the same jeans, right? Like, so it's all that same routine. Uh, and then everything in my day is scheduled on a calendar, right? So when I have that structure around it, I don't have to worry about discipline then, right? Because it's built into my day right off the bat. Um, I think the other thing that is important is to look at yourself in that light, right? To say, I am a disciplined person, not I want to be a disciplined person, right? And I think as you start making those small changes towards that, that's how you become disciplined, right? Some of the most disorganized people can become organized over time by making small changes. I'm going to clean up this corner of my desk and keep this corner of my desk clean. And I can start to think of myself as someone who keeps my desk clean, right? I think that can be applied to pretty much anything. Absolutely. We talk a lot about micro commitments. You know, if you're trying to run a marathon, forget about 26 miles, figure out how to get to the next stop sign, figure out how to go, you know, another block after you say you don't have any more, just make them little teeny steps. And as you stack those things together, it starts to make a huge difference. I think so on the topic of marathon training, what's really interesting is now there's a lot of people training for marathons that will not even run the 20 miler, right? Cause the typical, training is, you know, your max race is your or run is 20 miles before the 26, right? Now people have backed that down and there's training regimens that only get you to about eight to 10 miles before the marathon. Yeah. Right? I never ran a marathon in my, in the Ironman, I had never run another, I had never run a marathon until the Ironman. Yeah. Not even in training. <laughs> like, I was like, look, if I make it 120 miles, I'll figure out how to make it 20. <laughs> It was 16 and a half hours. It was not fast, but it was, there was nothing going to stop me. I'm like, you know, you can try to drag me off this course. I fortunately finished uh, under the, uh, the time limit, but it was like, you are not going to stop. I was unstoppable, you know, and it's, I, I want to point out one thing that you, you said uh, earlier, and I think this is so important. First of all, I, I love your answers because not only do I believe in, in what you said, but that's a lot about what we talk about, but I want to touch uh, on one thing here for the listening audience. And that is when something becomes your identity, there is no effort, there is no motivation, there is no discipline needed. It's just who you are. When I was training for the Ironman, I had bought a shirt uh, that was an Ironman, bought it off eBay or somewhere. It was an old finisher uh, jersey. I bought it five years ago. And it was in the drawer and I was like, one day I'm going to be that person. That, that was part of my identity. I was working up to that is who I'm going to become. And uh, it was interesting because that jersey, I just bought a random one. It didn't matter which one I bought. It was actually turned out to be the race that I actually like. I, it was a crazy, literally, you know, I, I brought it with me and I pulled it out. I was like, oh my God, this is <laughs> was from five years earlier. I, that was the half uh, I am that I did. But it was like, Figure out what your identity is. Figure out who you are. And when you start to live that, it, life becomes much easy, much yeah. easier.
Yeah, and I think you touched on it too before. It's the small changes towards it, right? We can all make small changes, no matter what they are. Um, and they add up over time. And then you get to that and you're like, I'm not going to not finish this race because I added up all these small changes and I got here, right? And it creates that momentum forward. Yeah, I love uh, my buddy uh, Jesse Itzler, the founder of uh, Marquee Jets, uh, Net Jets, sold it to Marquee, um, oh, husband to uh, Sarah Blakely. Um, we didn't come this far to come this far. Yeah. And uh, man, if you're on, if, keep going. Just one step, one step, one step. That's how I finished. That's how I finished mine. So, man, love what you're doing. Could talk for uh, for hours on this. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, I look forward to having you back. And uh, this is going to be an interesting chapter two for you. This is really, really important stuff, man. Uh, we need to change the lives of people because what we're doing to our bodies and our environment and what's happening to our health, man, we are causing a health crisis uh, through, through our diets. Yeah. hundred percent. Well done. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. 